Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming out to hear Toral Moy. I am your host, Lauren Elkin. Um, I'm delighted to be here and absolutely, absolutely delighted to be in conversation with Toral Moy, who's been one of my heroines since I was yay high. No, I'm joking. Just since graduate school, when I could actually read um, the kind of work that, that Toral produces. Um, so welcome, everyone who's coming in the back. Uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction, and then we'll just get right to it. We'll leave a little bit of time for questions at the end, in case you are all burning um, to ask some, some questions, which are, are most welcome. Can I ask, um, from the outset, has everyone, or is, is anyone here familiar with Sexual Textual Politics, which is the book that we're... Because it hasn't been translated into Norwegian, we were just discussing before. Okay, so there's a few who are familiar with it. Largely, okay, largely maybe not. Um, so I'll, I'll try to give a little précis, and then um, Toral can perhaps fill in some of the, the gaps that I, I might leave there. So Toral Moy is James B. Duke Professor of Literature and Romance Studies and Professor of English and Theatre Studies at Duke University, as well as the Director of the Center for Philosophy, Arts, and Literature at Duke. She is also an adjunct research professor at Norway's National Library for a period of five years. Is that ongoing now? Yeah. Very <laughs> exciting. Um, as an academic, she writes on feminism, literary theory, ordinary language philosophy and literature, with books on Simone de Beauvoir, Henrik Ibsen, and feminist theory. Her first book, which we will be discussing today, Sexual Textual Politics, Feminist Literary Theory, which was published in 1985 in English, has been translated into 15 languages. Her most recent book, Revolution of the Ordinary, Literary Studies After Wittgenstein, Austin, and Cavell, appeared from Chicago University Press in 2017. So today we're going to be talking mostly about Torl's feminist classic, Sexual Textual Politics, its legacy and its continuing relevance. Um, sexual Textual Politics presented debates within feminist literary criticism, which were current in 1985 and very much valuable today, both in terms of a genealogy of feminist criticism um, and for its continued assistance and clarity in confronting the questions which are still very much in front of us at the present moment. What are the political implications of a feminist critical practice? How do the problems of the literary text relate to the priorities and perspectives of feminist politics as a whole? Sexual textual politics is incisive, relentlessly brilliant, take no prisoners, as against a kind of rah-rah sisterhood that prevails at the current moment in social media, and I don't exempt myself from this. Um, Toral Moy shows that critique is a feminist gesture, that to push one's sisters, quote unquote, to ever greater specificity is in the common interest of furthering the cause of women and women's writing. Rereading this book for the first time since graduate school was an astonishing and thrilling experience. It was uncanny to find myself confronted with the very concepts that shaped me as a critic and the way that I think about literature, col culture, and politics itself. For example, in an early passage on Julia Kristeva, who argued that the modernist poetry of Loutréamont, Mallarmé, and others constituted a revolutionary form of writing, we learn the modernist poem with its abrupt shifts, ellipses, breaks, and apparent lack of logical construction is a kind of writing in which the rhythms of the body and the unconscious have managed to break through the structural defensive of sorry, the structural defenses of conventional social meaning. As such, the fragmentation of symbolic language in modernist poetry comes for Kristeva and for Moy, and for myself, as for many of us, to parallel and prefigure a total social revolution. So modernist, uh, disruptive, fragmented work is itself a way of, of fragmenting and questioning and deconstructing and reconstructing um, the political world in which we find ourselves. So this book was formative to me when I was starting out, and it keeps me on my toes now that I'm a bit further down the line in my career as a critic and a writer. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to speak a bit to Toral today and to include all of you and your, your thoughts on the questions at hand um, a bit later on. Um, so I guess, without further ado, my, f my first question would be, what, what is this book trying to do that I didn't cover in my introduction? <laughs> 
Well, I couldn't bear to reread the whole thing for some reason, but I did look at the beginning again, and I am st I was struck by the first sentence. Um, the sentence is this introduction to feminist literary theory, the first full introduction to this field, I believe, to be published in English, is intended for the general reader as well as for students of literature. Well, the first full introduction to the field of feminist theory. I was like, did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, and this is for me, you know, as you grow older, we grow no younger, as, mm -hmm. we, as they say. But this book came out in 1985. That's over 30 years ago. So, of course, I was young, and I was, I had... I studied in Bergen. I did my what we then call in Magistergrad, which is roughly a contemporary PhD in American um, parlance. Um, I did that on, femini on a feminist utopian writer, a writer of utopias, Christian Rochefort. Mm -hmm. um, and I was so keenly aware when I was a student in Bergen in the late 70s that I couldn't find any theory. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find anything to explain to me what can you do as you want. I wanted to be a feminist reader. Well, there were no models for that, certainly not in, in Scandinavia. And the few models I found, I discuss in this book. But I wrote the book that I really wished I'd had when I was mm. a student. So I think a, a good book is often a book you really think is, well, we just need to have a book like mm -hmm. this. And I'm like, I had in a way forgotten that it was the first. Mm -hmm. And I noticed, I should say, I'm into close reading, mm -hmm. right? So I noticed that I there's a footnote after this sentence mm -hmm. I read to you. Mm -hmm. And the fe sentence is, the footnote is a long discussion, and that's very strange for this book, which has very few footnotes, mm -hmm. and they are ve often very short. But here there's this long thing, because... I'm now going into, as, uh, as the book was almost finished, I discovered a book that set out to do mm -hmm. the same thing, or at least I thought. And so the footnote is, I wrote this sentence some months before the publication of Ken Ruthven's Feminist Literary Studies, which claims to be the first broad survey of both the dominant theories of feminist literary criticism and the critical practices which result from those theories, etc. And that, of course, you're young, you've never published any book before, and you think, oh God, here's some guy mm -hmm. who's published the <laughs> same thing. Awful. Right. And then I go on and on about why he hasn't done anything like <laughs> what I've done, <laughs> of course. But at least I hid it in a footnote. Yeah, exactly. So um, <laughs> I'm also astonished that I just set out to do it. It was very hard for me to start to have the confidence to write a book. I, I didn't necessarily think it was something, you know, I grew up in Norway, you mustn't think you got anything to teach us, right? The moike trua tu anua, etc. So that was one thing. And then of course, I studied in Bergen where I didn't have a single female professor. They were all men. Very good theorist, Atle Chitang, for example, and one woman uh, who was only teaching one course and was not hired by the university, who taught a course on French women writers, Elisabeth Orson. So without Elisabeth Orson, I don't think mm. I would have had any female teachers at wow. university. So for all those reasons, I am a little astonished that I just said, OK, I'm going to do this. And then when I did it, the voice in the book is very direct and strong. I just say, this is great, this mm -hmm. is bad, don't <laughs> read this, go for this. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I'm now very astonished at how I found that voice, and it sounds very confident mm. and strong. And that's not how I felt when I, before I started mm. it.
So what were the circumstances under which you wrote this book? Where were you working? Where were you living? Well, I couldn't find, finished my degree in Bergen. I couldn't find a job. I lived in Oxford and in, Eng in England. I managed to get somewhat one called uh, college lectureships, which at one point I taught at Pembroke College, Oxford, and I taught modern French. And at the princely salary of £2,500 a year <gasps> for six hours of teaching every week, and wow. I got two free dinners at high table oh, well. every week. <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> so, so, and those were in the good old sexist days. I had a good friend there. I was the... Um, so the hierarchy back then uh, still is, it was that the fellow of French was the person with a permanent job and a good salary mm -hmm. and so on, and of course a man, and that man was a medievalist. So then to teach their French students, they would have lecturers, college lecturers, to cover later periods, and I did the modern period, but you've got to realize that in Oxford, the modern period began <laughs> in 1715 <laughs> and ended in 1960. Right. So uh, I taught everything from 18th century onwards. And then there was another one woman, another woman at Pembroke back then, and that was the college lectrice, a French woman who taught French mm -hmm. language. She was from the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Mm -hmm. And she and I both had dining rights. That is, we could have those two dinners. <laughs> and we were the only women with dining rights right. in the college. And you <coughs> know how, and I was damned if I weren't going to do the mm -hmm. eating because I was earning so little. So I thought, well, I, at least I'm going to take these dinners, four courses and frog's legs and the <laughs> whole thing. Um, and what happened is that Claire, Claire Bazin, her name was, Claire and I would oh, go in. I know in Claire Bazin. You know Claire I Bazin? Do, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, we were, <laughs> she will really confirm funny. this. She <laughs> teaches English in, uh, at Paris. Montaire. Yeah. But um, she and I would go into high table. Now, you know, this is a very long table at the end of the dining hall. All the students are sitting lower down mm -hmm. on the, those tables. And the and you have to wear these black gowns, and all the men up there, the table might seat 25 people or something, and all the men are there, and we're all wearing these black gowns, and Claire and I come in there, and first of all, they did everything they could to prevent us sitting next to each <laughs> other because we couldn't chat away. Mm -hmm. And here's, this is an aside, but I'll share this with you to explain how the atmosphere mm -hmm. was when I started thinking about this. At some point, there are four courses, after which on some evenings an Oxford College is followed by dessert, which is you go to a different room where they smoke and drink sherry and hang out forever, which is a trial if there are all these old men mm -hmm. and you're these two young women, mm -hmm. you know? So, so, but you could skip dessert. Mm -hmm. So you, we would, Claire and I had skipped dessert, we were probably going to the movies or something, so we went straight into a different salon where you could grab a coffee. Mm. And in that salon, there's this older gentleman, I, I will not reveal his name, but I think he was the fellow of anatomy or medicine or something. So he's sitting reading his paper, we thought, mm -hmm. and we are standing up by a coffee table just grabbing a cup mm -hmm. of coffee standing before we run away and uh, we were chatting away in French of course mm -hmm. and that is the moment which I will never forget this man whom I he, who, he had never spoken to me in my six months in the college uh -huh. he closes down his paper gets up walk over to us mm -hmm. and it's etched into my brain and he turns to us both mm -hmm. and says in English, now we were speaking mm -hmm. French, anyway, women's brains are smaller than men's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a true story from Oxford <laughs> in 1983. Wow. <laughs> yes. Wow. And I thought, well, <laughs> and what was, what was so astonishing was that anyway. Right, exactly. Like anyway, <laughs> uh, had we addressed him? Exactly. No, probably problem was he didn't understand French, right, I assume. Exactly. Uh, so, but that was part Master of it. Master of the non sequitur. That is <laughs> crazy. Yeah, the, 
did happen. Yeah, God, that's, that's astonishing. Wow. Um, so this is the kind of context, context, you're young, you're trying to make a name for yourself. Um, had, had you heard of these feminist critics? Like, how, what was your sort of engagement with them before so you're writing or as you're writing? So what happened was I studied in Bergen. I learned a lot. I, I, I had a very good theory teacher, Atle Hittang. But he, uh, as it's not s no surprise to Norway, never taught feminism. He, did, he wasn't into teaching women mm -hmm. or feminist stuff. So I had a good, uh, at the time, that was probably the best place in Scandinavia to study literary theory. So I had a solid basis in theory. But I hadn't really, and I was a sort of really keen feminist, but my problem was how to bring the two mm -hmm. together, I mean, in my work. And when I, of course, went to Paris to study and to, I started hearing about these women after I finished in Bergen. I finished in Bergen in 1980 and couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. So I translated novels for quite a yeah. while. Um, but then I got these college jobs mm -hmm. in, in Oxford with their pleasures mm -hmm. and mm. <laughs> so on. Um, so then uh, when I arrived in England, I think that was the making of me. Mm -hmm. Because that's when people were starting to read Lacan and Foucault and all mm -hmm. these French theorists and also starting to pay attention to these new French voices. People like Irigaray, Sixou and Christeva started to publish in French, in the mi uh, feminist stuff mm -hmm. in French in the mid 70s, mm -hmm. anytime from say 72 mm -hmm. to 75. And they hadn't been translated yet or very mm -hmm. little. If you look at the Bi bibliography, mm -hmm. you will see how many texts I quote in the original mm -hmm. French because right. they just don't, now they mm -hmm. exist in English. Yeah. But um, th they exist in English partly because I wrote mm -hmm. about them. Exactly. So uh, I realized that, oh, there's all this exciting theory that I didn't know about in Norway yet. Because in Norway, Bergen it was known as the center for postmodernism in Norway, you know, literature in Bergen. But that didn't really start to happen until later in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So when I left at the end of the 70s, we were on to structuralism mm -hmm. and hermeneutics and mm -hmm. German theories and so on, but mm -hmm. not, not those new French mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So I realized in Oxford that I had one great advantage. I was a scholar of French. I could mm -hmm. read all these people. So I got a fellowship in Cambridge, Clare Hall, Cambridge, mm -hmm. and spent the whole year reading Révolution du langage mm -hmm. poétique. I read all the French mm -hmm. stuff. And then, that was in 81, 82, then I realized I know how to write this book. Mm. Uh, and then I started it and it was written in two years. Wow. I can't believe it. I just could never do that now. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> youth, <laughs> youth. Um, <laughs> yes. So the book, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the first part deals with Anglo-American um, trends in literary criticism and a kind of <laughs> approach that was um, common to feminist critics like Elaine Showalter or Gilbert and Gubar, um, a couple of other women. And then the second half looks at um, trends in French feminism, um, focusing on Hélène Sixou, Luce Irigaray, and, um, and Julie Christeva. And I really think, I mean, it's interesting to see the divide. I, I would like to know if you think there's still a, such a, a stark divide in terms of who's, who's doing what, um, Anglo versus French. But that, that French section in your book, I think, was really fundamental um, in terms of inventing a kind of French feminist theory or a, a, a way of seeing French, what was taken to be French feminist theory in the States and perhaps in the UK as well, that was not actually as monolithic as people took it to be. I think they just looked at your book, at the second half of your book, and was like, right, Sixou, Eric Garay, and, and Chris Eva, these are the French feminists, but then they themselves, as you point out in the book, wouldn't, don't necessarily see themselves as having anything in, in common or even being feminists necessarily. Um, so I guess my, my question, now that I've sort of laid that out, is how do you see that Anglo-French divide working today and, and what is the kind of status of French theory in general, um, uh, you know, across, across the world? Well, it's a really difficult question because, you know, back in the, I suppose France was the metropolis for theory ever since 
let's say, the existentialist. Mm -hmm. Sartre and Beauvoir after World War II, and of course my heroine of all these people is Simone de Beauvoir, mm -hmm. whom I don't write about here. Mm -hmm. That became the next mm -hmm. book. Um, but so for, I think, a whole generation or even two generations, people, intellectuals, would go to Paris, first to study Sartre and Beauvoir mm -hmm. and Merleau-Ponty, and then in the next move, there was Foucault, and there was Lacan, mm -hmm. and there was Eric mm -hmm. and Sixou, mm -hmm. and Christeva, and there were lots of others, of course, as well. Personally, I've always really liked the work of Michel Le Duff mm -hmm. and Christine Delphi, for mm -hmm. example. Um, but um, I don't, and later I went back to Paris and worked with Pierre Bourdieu. Mm -hmm. I did quite a lot of work on that kind of thing. And I suppose now, if you look at French theory from a distance mm -hmm. now, who is there? Well, Bruno Latour. Mm -hmm. That's the guy who gets read in literary studies mm -hmm. still. But, and there are some philosophers, but mm -hmm. there isn't the same, uh, mm -hmm. I have to say, I now feel that there just isn't the same magnetic intellectual attraction mm -hmm. to France. Yeah. This just, that generation mm -hmm. is over, you know. Uh, almost all of them are either not publishing anymore, of course, mm -hmm. many have died, mm -hmm. Derrida, Deleuze, mm -hmm. so they're all gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about um, Sixou or Christeva? What is there, or Rigaray? Are people still reading them in... in academic circles? I do see, I just, I, mm -hmm. I read essays that mm -hmm. do an Irigarayan thing, mm -hmm. take on mm -hmm. X, you know, I mean, they're still around, mm -hmm. but I think, I don't see, you know, if you look at what people choose to write new work on, new dissertations, new PhD studies and so on, it's not some, it's not them. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. It's just changed. Now you'd get things that people want to work on the Anthropocene, <gasps> on they do. ecology. They all want to write about the Anthropocene. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to, and that makes sense. Yeah. They don't want to turn to 40 year old mm -hmm. theories. Um, that doesn't mean that you're not, that you still teach some of this. If you, are, you were teaching an introduction to theory today, I still think that they might teach mm -hmm. Irigaray, Kristeva, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm. Um, but a lot of feminist theory nowadays has moved way past mm -hmm. this. So uh, you're more in the aftermath of Judith Butler mm -hmm. than you are in the aftermath of mm -hmm. Irigaray, I right. say. Yeah. So where do you see feminist literary theory specifically? Well, first of all, I don't think there is a feminist mm -hmm. literary feminist mm -hmm. literary theory mm -hmm. anymore. The femini there's a lot of feminist theory, like theory that tries to ex and p and but all that feminist theory has become very abstract and doesn't really deal much with literature mm. as such. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're not using literature, but I haven't seen you know, if you read what there is on, say, intersectionality, mm -hmm. I don't know how in, uh, intersectionality has been one of the big new mm -hmm. things. And that's very often written by people who are just as likely to be in sociology right. or philosophy or political theory as in literature. Mm -hmm. I feel that what happened to women's studies, now called gender studies, uh -huh, and right. gender and sexuality studies, mm -hmm. of course, but to start with in the 70s, you had departments of women's studies that began usually with lots of studies of literature and of history. Mm -hmm. The historians and the literary critics came together and studied representations mm -hmm. of women, women's work in history and so on. But at some point, and maybe that was the first 15 years, mm -hmm. so to, but at some point in the 90s, it shifts and it becomes theory. Uh, mm -hmm. And gender theory becomes a field. Mm -hmm. So then it's its own field and doesn't really need to deal with history mm -hmm. and literature and film. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they don't look at those as examples, mm -hmm. but their aim is not to contribute to literary mm -hmm. theory. So, so I yeah. feel it's different. Yeah. I mean, just to come back briefly to what you were saying about, um, we were talking about Fren French feminism, and I put that in scare quotes because I don't know if it's a monolithic thing, um, and you certainly don't suggest that it is, but you mentioned Michel Le Duff and, and Christiane Delphi. 
uh, Christine Delphi, who, uh, who, did, who were kind of marginalized in this kind of, in this vision of French feminism, probably because they were doing this very Marxist, um, very materialist kind of writing that wasn't necessarily about like breast milk and you know, all the things that make Sixou so sexy or that make, that make us so drawn um, to French feminism. I think probably because we, in America, we like to think about the French as being more like bodily and more you know, sexy or something. Right. Marxism is just not sexy. Um, so is there some kind of like endless divide that we can't seem to breach or branch, sorry, um, between this kind of gender theory that deals with intersectionality, perhaps mainly from an, a sociological perspective and, and not so much from a literary perspective, and then, I don't know, maybe there's a kind of gap in, in the market, so to speak, the academic market for talking about um, literature, the humanities. Well, you know, we have the crisis of the humanities mm -hmm. as well, so maybe, but I'm not saying there's no crisis of mm -hmm. sociology. Mm -hmm. I haven't mm -hmm. noticed right. that all the uh, people who attack the humanities don't go on to say, but we need more sociologists, mm -hmm. so <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to address the idea of who the French feminists were. Mm -hmm. After I published this book, I also I edited a couple of anthologies. Yeah. One was the Chris Christeva Reader, mm -hmm. which was all Christeva. And then I did, the following year after that again, I did a collection called French Feminist mm -hmm. Thought. And I had, in that, I had lots of historians, mm -hmm. like Michel Perrault, for mm -hmm. example. Right. Um, I had Christine Delphi, mm -hmm. I had Michelle Le Duff, mm -hmm. that fabulous essay mm -hmm. that she wrote. Michelle Le Duff is a philosopher. She wrote a fantastic <laughs> essay, I thought, called Cheveux Longs, Idées Courtes, mm -hmm. um, Long Hair and Short mm -hmm. Ideas, <laughs> which I thought is hilarious. It's about how women get invited by, so the common characteristic of how women were being allowed to study is that women were enticed to, as it were, take their ideas through a man. Mm -hmm. So you fall in love with the clever boy or mm -hmm. with the professor, mm -hmm. and they teach the girlfriend. That's the pattern, mm -hmm. and it's a pattern, of course, that many people have said was the case for Beauvoir and Sartre. Mm -hmm. So she was just the mm -hmm. disciple and so Which on. bullshit. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> but the, um, the, the Larousse, it was Michel Le Duff who pointed out that the Larousse Encyclopedia, which is a well-known encyclopedia mm -hmm. in France up through the 1970s and into the 80s, if you looked up Beauvoir mm -hmm. Simone de in mm -hmm. this encyclopedia, it read, uh, Femme de lettres, disciple de Sartre. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so that was in the encyclopedia when I started mm -hmm. writing my work on Beauvoir. Right. And the only book, uh, there were two books published on Beauvoir that I thought were at all, mm -hmm. uh, were like wonderful. One by a Swedish woman, Eva Gottlin, who she died very young, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Fantastic book. And uh, what the other one was Michel Le Duff, mm -hmm. L'Etude de Leroy, mm -hmm. which is a great book. Um, but it's not now when I sit here and I'm being invited to reminisce, mm -hmm. I realize that the sexism back then was just much more explicit. Mm, right, it's exactly. Doesn't mean <laughs> it's still <laughs> around, you yeah. realize, but it, it, they wouldn't say femme de lettres, disciple mm -hmm. de Sartre in quite mm -hmm. the same way mm -hmm. now. They would say maybe... Um, Contemporaine de Sartre, right, exactly. or compagne de Sartre, exactly, or yeah. something like that. You still can't talk about Beauvoir without Sartre. Basically. No, but you can talk about him without her, right, oh and yeah, that is not do. true. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, so, if you were going to write sexual textual politics today, what would it look different? Could you even do it today? No. Could one, not you necessarily, but you know? I don't think I could do it today. It's certainly mm -hmm. not. See. A, a good book comes from this need you have for that mm -hmm. book. That's what I felt, mm -hmm. you know. And I have, <laughs> well, first of all, since I did write it, I don't need it mm -hmm. anymore. So, um, but I also think that now we're in a different moment. Back then, we had intense discussions in the feminist groups I was in in, mm -hmm. uh, in Oxford, we would discuss whether there was any point in doing theory at all, mm. or should we just be political activists? Mm -hmm. In Oxford then it was, 
should we go down to Greenham Common? You know, where feminists had a, a sort of t camp tent occupation mm -hmm. of an American base where mm -hmm. they were going to deploy nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and they were protesting against that. Should we go down to Greenham Common or should we sit in our ivory tower and mm -hmm. write theory? Right. And um, I was always, first of all, I've never liked camping. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea of camping anywhere, Greenham Common uh -huh. or anywhere else, wasn't really my thing but the uh, I have always thought that of course feminists should do both and so on but a lot of the arguments around that t for me were anti-intellectual mm -hmm. the argument was well practical action and activism is the only thing mm -hmm. that counts and you want to sit there and not only write on feminist writers you're not even doing that mm -hmm. you're writing on theorists who write about writers mm -hmm. I mean this is like as ivory tower mm -hmm. and as Rochelle as mm -hmm. it comes, mm -hmm. you know. So I always uh, thought that, first of all, feminists need every every political movement has needed its theorists and its thinkers. Mm -hmm. There are no political movements to get anywhere unless you have someone who also is interested in finding out what it is we're up mm -hmm. to. And my argument then was, well, theory also has political effects. Mm -hmm. And if we don't know what our theories are, we will just be, s as it were, governed by our underlying assumptions, mm -hmm. but we won't know what they are. And in some ways, I don't always think assumptions are politi always political, but I do think that's true. I think if we are not clear on the parameters for our own work, we will not be able to see the issues clearly. Mm -hmm. And of course, I do think it's lim we can't always see. It. It's not like you can always see yourself from behind, mm -hmm. as it were, but you can try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea of clarifying the stakes, of showing the assumptions and pointing out the political, by which I meant this sexist, mm -hmm. non-sexist, feminist dimension of these ideas, I thought was really valuable. And so for me, that book was also, this is what I do instead of going to Greenham mm -hmm. Common. Right. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, I, something that's that that I find really interesting about the contemporary scene when it comes to talking about gender, writing about gender from a theoretical perspective, um, is the work of of someone like Maggie Nelson, who's oh trying. Yeah. I don't know if you've read her much, but who's trying to kind of, I don't know. It's it's not that it's popularizing theory so much as finding a way to write through first person narrative, um, political narrative, and theoretical narrative. So the Argonauts is so enhanced by you know citations from Yves Sedgwick or Deleuze and Guattari and, and you end up feeling like you've maybe spent a, an afternoon in a seminar you know, at a university but you also have gotten something else out of it that feels more personal and also more political. Um, I wonder what, you, what your thoughts are on the, the use of that I or that it in, the, in, the, in the theoretical text or in, in criticism or feminist criticism that tries to cross genres or blend genres. So first of all, I think Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts has been translated into Norwegian, Agunautna. I think it came out last year or something. And it is a, a fab, it's a very good read. I mm -hmm. strongly recommend it. It's a memoir, but about life on the margins of conventional gender categories, should mm -hmm. we say. Sure. But it's also one that, as you say, merges theories with gender, uh, with, with personal experience. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great genre. Mm -hmm. I have no problems with that. I have one proviso, mm -hmm. though. Maggie Nelson couldn't have written that. If you notice that the theorists mm -hmm. and so on that she quotes mm -hmm. have been around for a while. Yeah. It, she is benefiting from you know, the teaching and the translations mm -hmm. and the, if you like, um, slight domestication mm -hmm. of these theories mm -hmm. that has been going on in, in the universities and the public sphere for many years. Mm -hmm. I noticed that she doesn't... She, I just think it's really hard to incorporate absolutely new thought mm -hmm. in uh, that genre. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want it to be utterly cutting edge mm -hmm. and invent something new, I, I really think you need to engage with the theoretical mm -hmm. discourse. You need to uh, 
you know, pro mm. provide arguments, look at how this theory connects with mm -hmm. other theories. So all I'm saying is mm -hmm. there's such a wide sc scope and space mm -hmm. for what Maggie Nelson's doing, mm -hmm. but that has to, as it were, that work is interwoven with the idea that someone will also try to push mm -hmm. the boundaries of theories mm -hmm. further, purely theoretically. Mm -hmm. So you can see I'm still de <coughs> defending theory mm -hmm. as, as, as such, right. but I am in favor mm -hmm. of what she's doing. Right. Um, so in terms of defending theory as such, how does this, how does it meet up with your most recent work about ordinary language. I mean, what, what is ordinary? I don't know if we have time to get into it, but you could try. Well, <laughs> well the thing is, um, I write a bo uh, my book called Revolution of the Ordinary. It's about Wittgenstein, Austin, and Cavell. And in that book, I subject traditional modes of doing theory mm -hmm. to a really withering critique. Mm -hmm. So there's a way of doing theory that I think has come to a complete dead end, that it just mm -hmm. leads to abstraction. It loses touch with women's experiences and so on. That's one reason why I'm very interested in what Maggie, Maggie Nelson's mm -hmm. doing, because she's trying to make her theoretical thinking into with her experiences, mm -hmm. and I, I like that. And she also does it in language that you can admire and feel mm -hmm. challenged by. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I'm interested in... So uh, this is not the place where I'm going to now launch into my five-hour mm -hmm. lecture on foundations of, Wittgenstein, <laughs> uh, of Wittgenstein's vision of language, right? I'm going to spare you that. <laughs> but I think there's a... Where I disagree with myself mm -hmm. here is not actually in my defense of intellectual thought, mm -hmm. call it theory or philosophy, mm -hmm. whichever one. And it certainly isn't on the feminist mm -hmm. element, but it is in the underlying un understanding of language, mm. which here is the language that, as I had learned it from the French post-structuralist. Mm -hmm. I would now say that I actually don't think language works like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that um, I see here and there that there are many things in this book that I would still agree with, but, mm -hmm. um, but, but the idea that language is one central structure that has an outside mm -hmm. and that we should break it up is actually not mm -hmm. right, I mm -hmm. think. Now I think language is all the myriad infinite things we mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. It's our use. And you can break up some use mm -hmm. and all the others will still be around. Mm -hmm. So it's not quite as easy mm -hmm. as, as the language is... Uh, a bounded system mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. imply. So, right. so I would ha change that very deeply. But I would also say language is still, if, if you don't pay attention to your words and the words of others, you will simply not know what's going mm -hmm. on, as it were. And mm -hmm. that's like, that carries through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I read the, the couple of chapters that you recommended yeah. to me in the new book, and I was very struck by the way you're attempting to dismantle a, I don't know, a kind of a shared enterprise that we all have as academics or as researchers of generalizing as much as possible so we can say the thing that englobes all the other things and how destructive that is actually to thought and to the enterprise we're all supposed to be And it doesn't work with. either. Yeah. You, <laughs> you can can't never do, do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> you can never do it, but it gives you hours of fun and trying yeah. to do it. <laughs> yeah, right. So I suppose that the greatest change, you see this book is about theory, but it is written in a very clear language. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to read. I noticed in that first sentence, it's hard to read if you're not interested in feminist theory at all, but you know, you wouldn't presumably want to read this <laughs> book if you weren't. So I think a book should always try be readable as far as possible by the audience who might be interested in that. So my book on, on uh, Wittgenstein, Austin, and Cavell and literary studies is actually unbelievably readable, mm. considering, um, <laughs> just try it. <laughs> just try <laughs> yes, it. do try <laughs> it. Um, but, but anyway, we, yeah. No, maybe we'll take questions and we can come back to this if people are, are interested. Are there any questions? Otherwise we can just keep going. Don't be shy. Oh, don't be shy. 
Of course, you can ask your questions in Norwegian if you prefer. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, of course. I will translate. I'm them. sorry. I feel like I'm the I'm the drop in this room that makes <laughs> everything turn into English. Um, but yeah, please speak to each other in Norwegian. <laughs> yeah. No. No. In a way, one thing one could... Uh, so here are some questions that I could imagine answering. Okay. <laughs> it's, like, it's like writing your own <laughs> exam questions, right? Um, I am thinking, is, isn't it... So this is partly uh, about beginning... What's the difference between feminist work over 30 years mm -hmm. ago and now, and where mm -hmm. is it going? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I am told, so I am thinking, I'm tinkering with the idea. It's one among many, and don't come and ask me for this book in a year. But I would write, like to write a small book on feminist theory now. And what has inspired me no end is me too. Mm. I think that's like, we didn't have that mm -hmm. back then. I think good theory takes its starting point in some experience a social phenomenon or something that you really feel you want to think about. And what are the big topics that we didn't think about back then? My God, we had enough sexism to deal mm -hmm. with, and I'm not I don't want to be critical of what we did back then at all. I just noticed that, you know, things happen in 35 years. And one of them is Me Too. Another is the a total transformation of the concept of gender mm -hmm. that you have mentioned mm -hmm. too. That is, a lot of women... You're the one who reminded me of this, like... Mm -hmm. Christeva had this theory that you first you have a face of feminism where they want equality. Then you have a face where they emphasize difference, right? And then she hoped you'd get to a face where you'd see that both masculinity and femininity were metaphysical essences mm -hmm. and you'd get beyond it. Now that was argued on an incredibly abstract mm -hmm. mode. But the thing is, I have always been a feminist who was... I have never believed in gender essences. Mm -hmm. I have never been involved in, uh, you know, women are peace-loving and creative, <laughs> whether it was like women can create peace, so let's go to Greenham mm -hmm. Common, or women can get rid of pollution, so let's hug trees. I mean, all those things, I've never believed in them because... I wrote this book in England under Mrs. Thatcher, mm. and it seemed to me that one thing that was utterly clear from day one is that to get women into power is actually an excellent thing, because then you can get Theresa May. <laughs> now, the thing is, of course women should have access to every path of work in the world. There's no reason to exclude them, but equally, we just don't think that just because they're women, they're free of old ideologies. Not every woman is a feminist. Uh, there's nothing that comes with being more or less incarnated mm -hmm. as a woman that guarantees that you'll have political views that feminists mm -hmm. will like. And so I think there's now is a moment where those kinds of views are easier to argue mm -hmm. for. Because, for example, you have the transgender movement. And for me, it's just obvious that anyone who wishes to call themselves a woman uh, is so welcome to do so. Because every woman is different. This is, there is no one thing. This is the uh, mm -hmm. Wittgensteinian mm -hmm. underlying argument. Mm -hmm. There's no one thing that all women share. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it is clear that all women also all over the world have different class backgrounds, they live in different geographical conditions, they have vastly different personal experiences and so on. So why would we say that someone who started life as uh, uh, recognized as a male, why would we say that there is no possible path that that person could take mm -hmm. to come to uh, being a woman? I don't, of course their experience is specific and different, but so is mine. I mean, how many people come from the fjords of Western Norway and write <laughs> this book and so on? I mean, it's, it's how it goes. We're yeah. all different, yeah. right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Liechtenstein. And, um, I would like to hear about um, he and um, what you think about feminism. We know a lot of personality. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, I'll repeat the question because I have the mic. Uh, Wittgenstein and feminism, because we know a lot about the personality of Wittgenstein. Yes, indeed, we do. do. Uh, we hear that he wouldn't... He had several uh, women students, only one of whom he really got on with, and that was uh, Gillian Anscombe, the Elizabeth Anscombe mm -hmm. who translated uh, philosophical investigations. Um, he, <laughs> I, my argument about Wittgenstein is not that he shines by personal example. Mm -hmm. It is that his vision of language is remarkably wonderful and useful for anyone who wishes to pay attention to language and not get lost in the, uh, you know, the, the desire for abstraction that will take us away from any concrete experiences we may wish to think mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think we could have a wonderful discussion about Wittgenstein's personality. Mm -hmm. There's this famous story that he took out a poker, an Ildrake, and wanted to hit, was it Karl Popper, over the <laughs> head with it because Popper had gotten something wrong. <laughs> and um, he, he was aggressive. He kept telling all his students to give up philosophy. Now, that, I think, was perfectly consistent, though, with what his argument was, mm. that philosophy, as it's normally carried on, will just lose you in useless metaphysics, so go and do something useful, like <laughs> become an engineer. He was an engineer first. Or take up medicine. One of his be students became a psychiatrist and wrote wonderful memoirs about Wittgenstein. So Wittgenstein was very conflicted about the value of, should we say, business as usual in academia, and that's useful for feminists. Hmm. Maybe one more question, and then I think we have to call time. Yeah. Uh, you were saying to me that not every woman is a feminist, really. <laughs> You mean whether one calls oneself yes. a feminist and, and, or not? And also the, their approach to feminism, whether you may be sometimes opposed and you are <laughs> each other, you are. Oh, yeah. Well, the, are you, you bring up a very interesting question, Celia, which is how <laughs> the word feminism, the, uh, so this has been stronger in America uh, and in France than in Norway, I think, but it is quite true that th some of these French thinkers wouldn't use the word mm -hmm. feministe, mm -hmm. which yeah. was uh, somehow incompatible with their slinky, sexy, <laughs> the sinuous uh -huh. theoretic yeah. theoreticism. Le droit right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so feminists were often defined as in France as unfashionable, unsophisticated blue stockings, mm -hmm. maybe. So wearing ugly clothes, you mm -hmm. know, this is very yeah. bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, very bad. <laughs> so, um, but then in America, I wrote, uh, for the ones of you who find it easy to find these things, I think I have it on my website, actually, I'm not sure. Um, I wrote a very short paper 10 years ago or so called How Feminism Became the F Word. And what I saw then is I used to teach a class at Duke called Feminist Classics. And for a while, I got lots of students in it. But every time I taught feminist classics, I would begin with Rousseau and Mary Wollstonecraft, do John Stuart Mill and Henry Gibson because of a doll's house, and then continue with Wolf and mm -hmm. Beauvoir. Anyway, I always asked the students there, do you consider yourself a feminist when they took the class, mm -hmm. given that it was called feminist mm -hmm. classics? And then in the uh, sort of early 90s, they would still say yes. By the time I got into 
to the 2000s, almost all of them said, no, <laughs> I'm not a feminist. Yeah. Or as you know, I'm not a feminist, but. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a feminist, but I want equality for women. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. I'm not a feminist, but I want a career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, <laughs> and you better pay me the same thing. Yes, I, <laughs> I want equal pay and so on. And I w started wondering why this is. I mean, why would young women who choose to take a course called Feminist mm -hmm. Classics still say, but I'm not a feminist, mm -hmm. turns out that in America, the right-wing mobilization against feminism gets going in the 80s and really flourishes in the 90s with people like Rush Limbaugh mm -hmm. and all the right-wing religious people. They're the ones who coin terms like feminazis. Um, Feminists are women who enjoy killing babies. That I mean, this was I have lots of quotes mm -hmm. on that. So that by and above all, feminists are big, burly, ugly lesbians that no one can love. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the heterosexism is appalling, but it's underlying all of it. It's the idea that if you call yourself a feminist, you will not be loved. That mm. was the message mm -hmm. I found when I started looking. And of course, that frightens 19 year old mm -hmm. women. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so. But it's changed. I noticed when I gave a talk on The Handmaid's Tale in Oslo some a couple of years back, I noticed that Margaret Atwood in always refused to call Handmaid's Tale mm -hmm. feminist mm. because she wasn't going to be caught up in this right. discourse. I, have, I can give you the references. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's all Norwegian. Well, never mind. I have the references. Mm -hmm. um, and then... The cast of the first the first season of A Handmaid's Tale on television, which was done based on, on the book, mm -hmm. um, so I'm not referring to the later seasons, which I consider mm -hmm. inferior, mm -hmm. um, they also launched the whole thing without using the feminist word. Wow. Then me, two things mm -hmm. happened. Trump was elected because they'd mm -hmm. finished the, the taping before mm -hmm. then, and Me Too exploded. Oh, right. And now they call it feminist. Oh, yeah, it's so very trendy now. So I think the word feminist, I, have ne I always think there were, there were all kinds of reasons why f some theorists didn't want to call themselves feminist. I disagree with them. I think you claim that label for what you stand for. I just cannot understand why any any right-thinking woman would not call herself a feminist. We just should claim that label. Yeah. And I don't care what fancy theoretical and other reasons you have for mm -hmm. it. Of course, if you're not a feminist, you're not a feminist, but you have those ambiguous, mm -hmm. like, I want to play it on both sides, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. like that. But I think that we're now luckily in a moment in history where the feminism is becoming more an inward again mm -hmm. it's uh, and that's thanks to me too mm. yeah, yeah exactly and beyonce yeah well <laughs> but that's part of the same yeah, whole exactly. cultural thing yeah. she would say it but note at what time mm -hmm. she said it exactly. after trump wasn't exactly. it after trump yeah yeah or i think so no no after or do you, yeah so you see yeah right okay well on that i think we have to wrap things up but thank you all so much for coming thank you Toral. that was and thank wonderful thank you lauren <laughs> <laughs> Books are on sale, I'm sure, in the book tent, and, you know, maybe Torah will sign something if you have your copy with you. Bye. <laughs>